thing that happened in law enforcement since 1945. I come to work for the city of Cedar Town February 1st of 1945. We had two automobiles and no radio. Only way we could get a call, if one of all called us to come to your house, well, this light was up on top of the city hall. So they turned the light on. We went uptown to the phone right right at Moore Corner across the street there, and we got out and called, had to get the operator to call down to the office to find out where they wanted us to go. <laughs> so now that's the communication we had when I come to see you today. Now, we... Tell them how you acquired it. Tell them how you got possession of it. When I retired, well, uh, they took that thing off the city hall, and Jack Kaufman picked the bottom of it and brought it down to my house said the city manager said give it to me. So <laughs> that's the way I come to it. But now, <clears throat> this is a big walkie-talkie from what they got now. But I can stand here and talk to every car in Polk County, a sheriff, state patrol, a city police, city police in Rockford, city police in there, over this right here. Now, you know, that hadn't been but 47 years ago, and they come a long way in, in law enforcement. And, uh, of course, at that time, we had nine men working. Today, they got 20-some-odd working. We had two automobiles then. They got 10 now. We made $132 a month. We got $15 on, I mean, $30 on the 15 and 100 on the first. And that's what we made. We worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. And that was better than picking cotton, cotton <laughs> and I could tell you. <laughs> but I wasn't picking cotton when I come over here. I was selling an automobile, and that was better than selling an automobile. <laughs> but I've, I've been here, and you know, right after 1953, when Mr. Bill Bruner was the only one living now, appointed me chief of police. I thought, you know, I was 28, 29 years old. And, uh, but the first thing that happened, uh, my uncle got killed working for me up there on Main Street, Man Shotty. November of 13th, 1959, they robbed the bank up there. And uh, then November 27th, they, you know, they killed Miss Hackney up there and burnt the, set the house on fire. So, you know, I thought, well, I better go back to Rockmark. I said, you know, uh, it didn't seem like nothing was going well for me. But when I come to work here, I walk in at 5.30 in the morning to go to work. I'd never done a day law enforcement. I know nothing about it. And I didn't even wear a tie to work. So Dick Russell was fire chief, and the police station was in the fire department at that time. And he come down and he said, you going to work today? I said, yeah. I had talked to him the day before. He said, well, you don't even have a little tie. I said, I didn't even know there was a tie. <laughs> he went up there and got me a black tie and gave it to me. And I still got that tie. Of course, it's a little worn, but I still got it. And they didn't have a day training. They gave me a badge and a gun and told me to go to work. <laughs> and I went out with an older man who had been on the fourth before. I come along, and Fred would know him was uh, Lum Parish. They put me out with him, and we didn't have any training at all. To uh, the FBI would come in once a month and give a four-hour training. Of course, we didn't have no money either, so we couldn't hire nobody to train you. You had to just take what they give you. So then the GBI would come in, and then. I never will forget Captain Butler. He'd come every week after I made chief and talk to us. Of course, he'd tell us a lot of jokes to go with it, but uh, <laughs> that, that was. But things have got better in City Town. Uh, we would get, we, of course, we, only, we had two men to a car. We didn't have one car, but we had two men to it. And one man walking, shaking doors uptown. So then we would get two or three calls. I checked with John Dean yesterday, 
And I said, how many calls have you had in October? He went in there and come back. He said, we had 926. I said, well, if you had to turn that light on, you'd be real busy up there. <laughs> but, you know, uh, of course, you know, the attitude of the people had changed. Too. When I come to work up here, if I told somebody to do something, they'd do it. Work were right or wrong, they'd do it. But it ain't that way no more. Uh, you get a man now, and if he don't like it, he'll sue you. You don't have to hit him. If you just say something to him, he'll sue you. I may be talking about coming to Kenneth Prime. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the people, the good people of this town have got to stay on the jury. They can't go up there and get off. You've got to have good people on the jury. The worst case that I ever worked in, in 43 years with the police department, when they went in the college street and got that kid and carried her off out here and raped her and killed her. It took 11 years to burn him. And I guess that's the only one from the city town since I've been here has been executed. But that man had that many appeals. It took us 11 years for them to execute him. And that's a disgrace. I don't care how you feel about the execution. Uh, Rectification to, 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 to a crime, I don't care what anybody tells me. If I think I'm going to get burnt, I think again before I do it. But the man that killed my uncle who worked for me, Will McCown, he never got burnt. He served nine years and got out. And then threatened to kill me. I didn't like that either. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, <clears throat> when you, well, you know, when you, uh, I had 20, 25 men when I left them. But that was just like 25 families. I mean, we were together every day. And uh, you just get a, a real close feeling for law enforcement if you stay in it long enough. Of course, I guess you do anything else. But uh, I know you do law enforcement, so I just, they just called me before I left home tonight and told me that they didn't think Paul Puckett would be up there tonight. And uh, I rode with Paul Puckett 30 years. I mean, you know, it just, it's just bad. Uh, but Paul is 80 years old. But, you know, and I don't like much being that, but I <laughs> I don't want to leave here. Well, not right now, no way. But, you know, we all got to go sometimes. I was talking to him last week down there, and he was, he was my assistant chief when he retired. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Chief, I'm going to die. I said, well, I am too. He said, yeah, but you ain't in bad shape. I mean, he said, I won't be here Christmas. But he said, it ain't worrying me either. So I said, well, it's a good way to feel is you know you're going to die and it ain't worrying you. I mean, I, I feel like if I died, I'd, you know, I, I feel like I'm all right. But uh, it probably worried me a little bit too. But he said it didn't worry him. But now the Miss Hackney case, when Rachel Watley killed her and set the house on fire. That was a bad case. And uh, we had, and Rachel was smart. I mean, he was a smart boy. So when I got the dog up here from Carrollton, we didn't have any dog. You know what he done? He went out there and patted them on the head. So they didn't bother him. They run around all night and never did pick up the when, the, when, the, when that boy unloaded the dog out of that truck, so we felt like whoever done it went out the back door. Well, we went around there. They picked up the scent, but they went right back around the front. So I think, and, and I like Rachel, uh, but he, he was wrong. And you know, he went off down to Millersville. They said he was He didn't know what he was doing. Then he got a gun in there and killed himself. So, you know, these things just, just ain't right. I mean, uh, of course, I know most of all knew, knew Miss Hackney. She was a fine lady. I talked to her at the post office at 5.30 that evening before I was up at her house, up at Mr. Hunt's house at uh, about 1.30 that night and she was already been killed. But she was on her way home when I stopped and talked to her. <laughs>
I was coming out of the post office and she was going in. It was Thanksgiving, wasn't it? November 27th, 1959. This is November 27th. 26th. 26th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> when they robbed the bank, that was a different story. I guess we, uh, we didn't, uh, the people that joined in county done it, but we put out a lookout for them, and uh, they got $44,000 up there. And we got back $44,700. So we got back more money. <laughs> we got back, Mr. Fred told me, he said, that's more than we've all. I said, well, that's what they had on them. I don't know where it come from. But I'm sure they got it somewhere else. So <laughs> but uh, John Redden was sheriff at that time, and I told him, I said, John, you don't get no tip out of this. I said, and Mr. Fred was saying there, he said, no. <laughs> but law enforcement was good to me. I enjoyed it. I appreciate all letting me serve you best on. But uh, it's... I'm glad I'm away from up there. I'm glad that I don't have to go up there every day. So, you know, I sit up every night watching news, and there's not a night past that four or five ain't killed in Atlanta. So we are lucky to be over here. You'll have probably one a year, two a year. But uh, thing is just, thing is just not right. I mean, you know, when, when you can't go home and go to bed without being disturbed, like somebody breaking in on you, it ain't right. We have a lot of burglars here. And when I come to see you down, we run white liquor all the time. We didn't we didn't even know nothing about dope. You know, we, I don't get for twenty years I come here, we never had a case of uh, narcotic or nothing up there. But now you'll never get nothing about white liquor. It's all dope now. They get marijuana and cocaine and all that stuff. And when they get on it, they crave it. I think, uh, I've seen them climb the wall up there, picking at the bugs on the wall. And there wasn't no bugs there. So, I mean, they just, it, it drives them crazy. But I guess I took up about all the time I want to hear me speak. Chief, at the time you retired, I know that you had served longer than any other chief police in the United States. Is that not true? Yes, sir. Did you know if anybody else would have equal your record? Not yet. I told, uh, they called me from Atlanta and said, you served 34 years chief of police? I said, yeah. They said, did you know you were the oldest chief of police in the world? I said, I am in age, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we organized the Georgia Chiefs Association in 1960. And uh, they had their 30th anniversary two years ago, I guess. There wasn't but two of us down there. I, I come and ask them where all the people are. They said, oh, they did. They did. And I got down to Leo Brightwell, who was chief down at Griffin. I said, well, what happened to Leo? He said, he's in the nursing home. So me and George Ward from Everton, Georgia, were the only two of us there. And the man that drove up the charter for us was a retired FBI agent. And he was signing in at the hotel at the same time I was. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing now? He said, going to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever wear a bulletproof vest? No, ma'am. I never shot nobody while I was. I never was shot at. Never was shot at. I walked into man house one day and he threw a uh, shotgun on me. Well, he was drunk, but I didn't know him. They just called me and I went in there. You know, I never looked down the barrel of a shotgun before. But that thing looked that big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, come to find out, it didn't have no shell in it, but I didn't know it. I took it away from him and broke it over the banister of the door, I mean, of the port. But then it didn't even have a shell in it. But I, I tell you, that's a big barrel look at. <laughs> Where did you use that Billy Club much? No, I carried that in the automobile with me for 30 something years, but I never hit nobody with that. But if you got out with it in your hand, it'd keep you from having to hit them. But now, see, they had all this stuff back then. We had to do the hard work. 
But now, see, they got a stun gun now. I brought one along to show you. See, if I walk over there and touch Jane with this thing, <laughs> it'd knock him out. Is that right? It sure would. If you mess that in, in your arm like that, mm -hmm. I guarantee you you'll go down. But we didn't have nothing like that then. They'd come along later. But you have to get close enough to something. Well, you have to touch them with it. Oh. You want me to try it on you, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> How about mace? Is that pretty good stuff? They got something better than that now. They got what they call pepper now. And it's made out of red pepper. pepper but he, if you spray somebody in the face with it, well, they ain't going to see nothing for a while. Every patrol car that carry pepper spray have also got a gallon of water in it. So the only thing to get it out of your eye is water. So if they got pepper spray on their belt, they got a gallon of water in the car. And that's one of the rules. You just have to carry it. So you can't get that pepper out of your eye no other way. Well, I wonder sometimes if the media is fair to the law enforcement. I know I, this summer I was in Panama City and a man had gotten drunk and gotten in a fight and, and uh, going to take his automobile and go somewhere and his friend threw the keys away and he got mad with him and fought and then they called the police. Well, he went to the ocean and got in the ocean. And early the next morning, they had a boat, police, uh, coast guard, <coughs> all these people. And they said he was trying to commit suicide in the ocean. I don't know, it was a young fellow. But they finally ended up with about three or four men from the shore went out there to get the boats. Kept telling him to go to the shore, to go to the shore. And he was fighting and diving under the water and hitting the policemen and all that. But they finally got him and brought him up. And the next morning in the paper, the headlines were, so-and-so sues the police because they used pepper spray. <laughs> now, to subdue the man, they used pepper spray, and the police were- Well, the you know, that's a lot better than this. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were getting uh, sued, though, for it, and, and charges. The policeman that sprayed him was uh, suspended for the time being. Well, you know, as I said, we made $132 a month and I come to work. They make probably 20, 20 or 21000 now, but they earned every dollar. They not overpaid, I can tell you. Now, we may have been overpaid back when I come to work. <laughs> but they not overpaid because they take abuse every day. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure when I was up there, I was always glad to see somebody coming that didn't want nothing. I mean, uh, I was over in Atlanta talking to Colonel Bell one day, and he he said, Chief, what can I do for you? I said, not anything. He said, well, come in and sit down. You're the first man been here. Then didn't want something. <laughs> but, you know, when you deal with the type of people that law enforcement have to deal with, you know, they're going to get hardened down the line somewhere. There ain't no way you can get from it. So, the people they deal with are the people that all might meet on the street, but you ain't going to take up no time where me with you, just going to keep going. And uh, I know when I go to town now, uh, if I meet one of my customers up there, I just keep walking. I mean, one before I retired, I don't stop and take up no time with them, so I just keep on going. But uh, people in me, I mean, the type of people that law enforcement deal with it mean uh, and what we got to do is when we get them in court do something to them because if you don't you're going to have them right back out there on the street doing the same thing but we were talking about drugs a while ago the different than the drug and alcohol if you put a man in jail for being drunk on liquor next morning he would want to get up and go to work if you put one in there on drugs, he ain't going to be able to work the next day. He's going to lay back down and holler all day. And I sure envy anybody that got, like Sheriff Bowman got out there and got 400 and something in jail or 300 and something. I sure would hate to put up that many every day. So, you know, every one of them wants something different. He's got 400. 
he got a bunch of them. I, now, I may be wrong on the number, but he told me he didn't have no empty bed down there. How many of that jail holding? How long did they stay out there? Some of them stay out there a year at the time. You know, if they, if the judge sent up one to five years, what well, the sheriff got to keep him until the state come and picked him up. And if they don't come, he just got him. And uh, they say all the prisons are full. So if they full, I say it's built a new one. So you can't turn them people out. Uh, she, uh, how does the law has changed where the criminal, or the one that does the bad part, has more rights the whole right now than the police does. Well, you know, uh, law enforcement don't have any rights no more. I mean, they ain't no... How'd that come about? <coughs> really, James, law enforcement, a police when you see out here on the street, he just about made the made night watchman out of it. They don't give them no right to do anything. If they hit somebody, they go and go off and sue them. And, the, I'm, and I'm sure the city is not able to pay for all them lawsuits. So uh, if it's the uh, state patrol, uh, county police, the county got to take care of them. If the state patrol, the state got to take care of them. So they are just wanting you to do something where you can get sued. And if you go with the 34 years I was up there at Chief Police, I didn't have a lawsuit. But John tell me now, every once in a while he had one, but I didn't have the first in a while. How did this get to be, Ms. Well, it, I tell you, James, I think the people change their attitude. I mean, I think a lot of people need to have an attitude adjust, adjust to back where it used to be instead of away. Now, you take you go over in court. Well, a, a fire example of this, and I'm not talking about the judge uh, or nothing, but they caught a drug man, and I know you all read about it because Jack went to jail about it. But anyway, they caught this drug man, and they uh, took his money and the automobile and all, and they gave him their money back before they even tried him. And Jack went to jail because he wouldn't sign the check. Now, and, and I told the judge up there that day, I said, it's a sad day when the drug dealer go free and the sheriff go to jail. I mean, I don't, I mean, I think Jack was wrong in not signing the check, but I think the judge was wrong in order to him to sign it. Of course, that, that wasn't my business, and I didn't take that up. But uh, any time at a, at a drug dealer in this county, can send the sheriff to jail and him get his money back at the sad day. Now, I tell you, uh, I am a firm believer in law and order, whatever it takes. Now, uh, of course, I couldn't, I couldn't be no other way, but <laughs> I mean, I stay in it that long, but I believe in law and order. I believe in electrocuting people. I believe in eye for eye. I just believe in these things. And I think until we get back to it, we're going to still have other problems. One problem right or another. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.